Hi, this is Brian Kim. I want to share with you this case of a patient who has a 2 to 3 plus dense lens. And there's two challenging parts to this case. This patient has a really deep set and tight orbit. And so you're feeling like you're having to work in a hole. And also this patient has a strong Bell's reflex. And so, and the, the third thing is this is the left eye. And for me in general, the left eye is a little bit more challenging, especially with the deep set eye, because with my chopper in my left hand, I'm closer towards the patient's cheek area and so so you'll see how I'm able to navigate through and deal with this challenging case. So first things first this patient has some lashes that are exposed. I really don't like any lashes. We use Tegaderm when we drape our patients and so I snip those lashes and then we're going to put some more betadine on the eye just for extra assurance that we're killing any germs on the ocular surface. You can see there's a lot of pooling. And again, this is because this patient's very, very deep set. This is the left eye. You can see the strong Bell's reflex as well. You see all that pooling. I'm having the cotton tip. It's just absorbing all that water there. And it's gonna interfere with a little bit of my view as I'm doing the case. So I'm holding the eye steady with the cotton tip. You can see it's already soaked. So it's not as good at holding the eye with this actually. I marked the central cornea with my corneal marker. And then I'm turning the eye down towards the left and I make my paracentesis incision on the right side and then the left side. You can see this patient resists my movements and again has that strong Bell's reflex. I'm able to steady the eye and then make a flat approach parallel to the iris plane, which creates a nice corneal shelf and allows me to achieve a self-sealing incision. Of course, this left side is a lot easier because of the Bell's reflex. This is some intracameral lidocaine and then some intracameral epinephrine and then some dispersive viscoelastic to coat the corneal endothelium and flat, flatten the anterior capsule. I'm doing the Orlock technique as I'm turning the cannula and I'm rotating it so that it orlocks within the incision and I'm trying to turn the eye down. I make the triplanar corneal incision. I make a vertical groove, place the blade into the deep part of the groove, try to control the eye with the cannula, and then I enter. Again, I'm working in this deep hole. You can see all this water pooling. When I operate, I, I tilt the head temporally significantly. I turn the head towards me. And so I'm really giving myself the best advantage to get rid of that pooling water. But nonetheless, you can see how much water there is pooling. This is a sharp tip Haldi Perkar forceps. I puncture the capsule centrally, pull down, grabbing the right side of the tear and then creating a flap and then going around circumferentially. Again, trying to make the rexus size and shape, which will match that corneal mark that I made earlier. These are very low profile forceps. I have a lot of control and confidence when I'm making the rexus with these forceps. Finish off the rexus, burp some viscoelastic out. And this is the Capsular fornix hydrodissection technique. I place a cannula under the rexus edge contraincisionally, get a nice wave, decompress on the left side, sweeping and hydrodissecting the anterior capsule on the left side, doing the same thing on the right side, hooking the peripheral lens, and the lens begins to spin. Irrigating the surface of the eye, again, you can see this eye is basically underwater. This patient has that strong Bell's reflex, and the eye is turning to the right. Again, quite a few challenges with this case. Now that I have two instruments in the eye, I have a lot more confidence. I'm placing the chopper under the rexus edge contraincisionally, the fake tip vertically subincisionally, bringing the instruments together, and you can see it clearly and easily fractures the lens in half, and that's double chop, placing the chopper on the right hemonucleus, sudden loss of resistance, fracturing that right hemonucleus in half, lifting that first quadrant up with a little bit of vacuum, getting the chopper around it, crushing the lens between the instruments into smaller and smaller pieces, and then emulsifying the lens piece. Again, when you're using double chop and cross chop, that's the beauty of the technique. Even though I'm working inside a hole, this is not a limitation to lens disassembly when I'm using mechanical fracturing forces, double chop and cross chop to disassemble the lens. I'm turning the second quadrant in front of me, placing the chopper around the lens, crushing it against the finger tip, crushing the lens into smaller and smaller pieces, and then emulsifying the lens pieces. You can see this quite a bit of density to this lens. And you know that because when I bring that chopper towards the fake tip, there's a sudden loss of resistance and a snap, almost like a snap when I'm 
fracturing the lens and you can feel it between the instruments that snap or loss of resistance is an indication of that density of the lens. So that first heminucleus is out. I'm going to rotate the second heminucleus in front of me. Since the lens is out, it's again loose in the bag, no zonular traction with that. You place the chopper around the heminucleus, pulling it centrally toward the victim, fracturing the lens in half, doing the same maneuver around that third quadrant, getting that chopper, hooking it around the lens equator, bringing it towards the fricative and crushing the lens in half again using successive crushing forces to break the piece into smaller and smaller pieces and then emulsifying the lens piece. This is the last quadrant placing the chopper around the lens, hooking the peripheral lens at the equator, pulling it towards the fake tip, fracturing it in, in half, and then using successive crushing forces to emulsify the lens pieces. Again, using successive mechanical fracturing forces to emulsify the lens piece. Now I just have epinucleus left. It's a little bit stubborn. You want to be a little bit careful in this situation. You don't want to be grabbing the lens material and then grabbing the bag. But I obviously have confidence here and it's hard to tell on the video but three-dimensionally, I must feel confident that the posterior capsule is back. So I take the chopper out, push BSS in, take the phaco tip out, and I go in with the INA handpiece. You can see the patient still has a strong Bell's reflex. Every time I go in and out of the eye and irrigate fluid on the eye, the patient squeezes and the lens again goes up, which again is to the right on the screen here. So as you can see, I'm in cortex mode, polishing around the anterior capsule and then switch to polish mode and polishing on the posterior capsule as well and polishing underneath the anterior capsule. This is really a pretty clean bag in this case. pulsing into the subincisional capsular fornix just to look for any adhesions of cortical material. And there is, you can see there's some fine wispy lens material that's coming out. And this is cohesive viscoelastic. I'm gonna switch to cortex mode and then turn off irrigation. And when I turn off irrigation, I fill the eye with viscoelastic. If you have irrigation on, all it will do is cause a pressure head and cause the viscoelastic to shoot out of the eye and of course that's not really helpful. So I like to turn off continuous when I push the viscoelastic to fill the capsular bag. Sweeping underneath the rexus edge first on the left side and then the right side, you can see how much water there is there pooling and obstructing the view. Thankfully I'm still able to see without much difficulty even though I am literally working in a pool of water. Going in with the single piece acrylic lens into the capsular bag. Go in with irrigation off, activate irrigation, making sure the haptics are off the optic, tilting the optic, rotating at 90 degrees clockwise, making sure I remove all the viscoelastic from within the bag, ensuring that both haptics are still within the bag as well, polishing underneath the rexus edge and removing any potential lens epithelial cells, switching to visco mode, and then I'll hydrate my incision. So again, this is a patient with a deep set eye, tight orbit, also a strong Bell's reflex. You saw I was able to perform my standard technique and then using the Orlock technique to control the eye, turning it down. You have to use the Orlock technique especially for me in a, as a right-handed surgeon on left eyes, you have to be able to twist that cannula within the incision, which grips the incision. And then I'm able to turn the eye again towards the left on the screen in order to make my incisions and continue to do the steps of surgery. With the deep set eye, 
again, some people it might be a challenge or a problem, but because I'm performing mechanical fracturing techniques, even if it's deep, it doesn't really interfere at all whatsoever with my maneuvers. Double chop, cross chop does not depend upon having a deep set or a uh, prominent globe. I'm able to disassemble the lens in any situation. Again, because the instruments are relatively vertical when I'm doing the chopping maneuvers, especially the double chop. And then again, the cross chop is so versatile because you can chop at any vector angle. So that's the beauty of cross chop. You can chop at any vector angle and using crushing forces to disassemble the lens. And again, you saw this patient had a pretty dense lens, but the CDE was fairly reasonable. And this patient had a nice clear cornea post-operative day one, and the patient did well. So I hope this was helpful to you. And I thank you for your attention.